You can't train for a four-day event. You, you, you train for a two-day event and then you try and keep going. They are long-distance rowers. They can take a, a quite a lot of pain if anybody can do it. Those two guys can do it. We are such a strong team together. I think we can be, excuse the pun, but we can be awesome. January 2004, and 16 men, armed with one 10-meter wooden rowing boat, are taking on two rivers, two of the busiest commercial shipping lanes in the world, and one epic challenge. These men are preparing for the 480-mile trip to break the world record for rowing from London to Paris and improve the lives of MS sufferers along the way. Led by team leader Colin Falaise, They've done tough trips before, but this time, it's against the clock. This is a race, and in a race, particularly rowing, you need every one of your team working totally in unison. And so you have to be totally focused, you have to be totally fit, and you really want to, we really wanted people to, to buy into this 100%. We didn't want any half-hearted, you know, um, team members. So that was right, yeah, at the start. I said, well, look, if you don't think you can do it, you can't last the four days, or you can't focus on breaking this full record, then leave now. During the months of training, they've had to use a practice boat. They finally get the real one just four weeks before the start and hope it's all ship shape. The first test is to launch it and put her through some basic sea trials. The team say she looks good, but are anxious to find out if she can do the business on the water. With only weeks to go, they can't afford to have much go wrong. But the delight soon turns to despair. Just minutes after launching, they plow headfirst into a buoy because the rudder isn't doing its job properly. The frustrated rowers decide the session is a washout and head for dry land to start the post-mortem. tried this rudder before so I'm probably going to make another one and uh, keep trying because it's the boat <laughs> runs straight basically it doesn't like to turn because it's very it's a veed bottom and it's very long so it just wants to go straight all the time so you we're struggling to, to steer it quick enough with the start date bearing down on them they haven't much time to sort out the rogue rudder if it yeah, doesn't work it's... properly it could scupper no, their chances a perfect day for the last training session. It's just after seven on Sunday morning and is the last time the whole team get together before the big day. It's a chance to get some vital technical points sorted out. But one of the rowers, Mark Windsor, has injured his knee in a basketball accident. With just weeks to go, this is a bitter blow to the crew. I, you don't need to be told it's two weeks away, okay? The first thing, Obviously, we know that Mark's now, well, you know, 99.9% out of the actual rowing activities, and he's absolutely devastated. It's not, it's not the fact that, you know, we can't, we, we can't wrap ourselves up in cotton wool, but I am just going to stress to you that taking care of yourself over the next two weeks just might be a consideration. There's things that you have to do, there's things that you have to continue to do. But if you could give something a bit of consideration that you think, well, it might just jeopardize yourself and you don't need to, you know, um, then, then let's maybe give it a little bit of thought. That's all I'm asking, okay? Because it will cause considerable problems if we go down um, any lower. You know, it's the old, so the gobsmack routine, it was just, I was uh, almost tearful because I just, I, you know, it just hadn't dawned on me. So nothing was going through my mind. My mind emptied, it was, uh, it's just shock, really, because um, it really wasn't uh, what I was expecting. But the rest of the team have to stay motivated and get on with the job, 
They will be rowing for one hour at a time, which means they need to change the five-man crew every hour. So it's vital they make these changes as quickly as possible so they don't lose time. The system works like this. At the start, the first five rowers will be from guard boat Tristan, leaving three resting. They'll row for an hour before the Leka Leka rowers are picked up by the rib and taken to the rowing boat where they change over. The five rowers from Tristan will return to their boat where one will drop out and one of those resting will step in. After nine hours of that, they get a well-earned seven-hour break. During the course of the session, they manage to shave 30 seconds off the speed of the changeovers. If they do that when it counts, it might save them almost an hour in time. With the start now imminent, the question is, have they done enough? They've made it to London three days late after bad weather forced them to postpone the start date. Last minute preparations are made in St. Catherine's Dock and everybody's taking time to relax before one o'clock when it's time for the talking to stop. Any nerves aren't showing. All the suspense has gone and now it's down to the reality of it all. A little bit of adrenaline, you know, uh, even though I'm not on the sort of first shift. But when you just, everybody's ready to go, you know, so it's, uh, rock and roll as they say. Yeah, we're all, all in good spirits. Yeah, everyone's quite relaxed, a bit nervous, but excited. But yeah, we're just really looking forward to it now and hopefully break that world record. They start when they pass under Westminster Bridge in the shadow of Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. Following the river all the way down until they spill out into the English Channel and the busiest commercial shipping lanes in the world. The authorities say they have to cross them at right angles but the French won't let them cross in their waters. The organisers challenge this, but instead they have to go to the end of the lanes and back towards the Seine. The entrance to the French river roughly marks the halfway point, and they have to arrive here at the right time so the tide is flowing with them. Then it's head for the tower and don't spare the horses. If they are on course for the record, they should be there by the early hours of the fourth day. As time nears, they're all playing out the next four days in their minds. The highs, the lows, and their biggest fears. And top sport experts know exactly how big a task they've set themselves. Well, for four days, that's going to be a major challenge for them. What they're going to need to do is work very hard on their nutrition between their bouts of rowing. So depending on how long they're rowing for, in those rest periods, it's crucial that they get adequate nutrition and particularly carbohydrates into their bodies. Confidence, confidence is huge and, and confidence comes from achieving things, yeah, performance accomplishment. If I've done it before I know I can do it again. Well, you say no one's rode for four days so everyone must have some concern on how they're going to cope and how they're going to last. As the first crew get ready down the river, some of the less experienced rowers are nervously waiting for their moment and have no idea what to expect. Many suffer from seasickness, which can seriously affect the crew and performance. Basically, I think I just want to get on and do it, you know. We chat to all the guys and they sort of say, you know, this is going to happen. You've got the third day, which is, until now is something that none of them have sort of been through. Um, so they don't know as much as myself, but I don't know what I'm going to be like the second day or at the end of one day or, you know, it, it's going to be a mental challenge more than anything else, so, yeah, I just want to get on and do it, really. And he doesn't have long to wait. The crew approach Westminster Bridge and as Big Ben strikes one, they pass under it. Next stop, Paris. Here we go, guys. All right. There's no turning back, and there's no knowing what challenges lie ahead. All they can hope now is that their training has been enough, and the problems with the boat are all sorted. They've got just over 90 and a half hours to get to the French capital. If they don't, they've failed. Back at the start line are the shore crew getting ready to leave for France, where they will make sure the locks stay open for the rowers. 
Tony is glad to see them go. Relieved that they're on the water and they're on their way. A lot of organisation by a lot of people to get here. They've gone. Next stop, Paris. The Lekka Lekka crew are ready to step up to the plate for their first shift. It's the first of many, as there could be up to 90 changeovers altogether. The first hour has been tougher than they expected. As the rib pulls up alongside the boat, something they feared became a reality. Lloyd was the first to spot it. The rudder that caused problems in training had jumped out of its housing. It's broken in relatively calm waters. With some quick DIY, it's repaired. But now the crew are worried whether it will hold out in the strong seas ahead of them when they need it most. The second crew are now well on their way. But event coordinator and skipper of guard boat Tristan, Rob Platts, has his finger on the pulse. He spent six months plotting the route in minute detail. He knows exactly where they should be at every point and is only letting a few key people know how quickly he expects them to finish the trip. What is, what is your target time? Uh, in total? Uh, His secret schedule would mean they get to Paris in around 82 hours, which is eight quicker than the record. Withholding information is all part of Rob's cunning master plan. <laughs> we can say nothing. Bear in mind, this will be after the. Uh, yeah. 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 The yeah. Motivation. Yeah. Yeah. What I don't want to do is tell them each hour how each team is doing because it's, it becomes a race between the teams and, you know, it, it, the, they could lose sight of the overall objective, so I don't want to do that. I want to tell them every four hours how the team in total is doing. So. Um, be um, like the UK. And, and I'm not sure I'll tell them the truth then. <laughs> <laughs> Once out of the main river, the water was very shallow, which has made it very lumpy and difficult to carve through. It's a bit choppy now, um, but still rowable. Uh, they tell us when we get around the corner it might calm down a bit, so we'll look forward to that. And so we've got, I mean, the, the surf is sometimes going with us, we sometimes have the wind coming up our tail, so we can maintain relatively good good boat speed, just incredibly uncomfortable. So, uh, you yeah, know, all spinning, a few crabs being caught, that kind of stuff. Not to worry. Soon it'll be dark so people won't be able to see the mistakes we make. They can't control the weather, but they can make sure they keep their energy supplies up by eating enough food. But it also needs to be the right type. One of the biggest problems with endurance exercise and endurance sports performance is running out of fuels. Um, the major fuel for exercise is carbohydrates. So the carbohydrates we eat get stored in the liver and also in the muscle cells. Now after approximately two hours of exercise, these will become depleted. And we often hear of marathon runners hitting the wall, and that's exactly what happens there. They're running out of these carbohydrates. Now the effect, of course, of this is that the athlete has to slow down. By slowing down, they can rely m more on the fats which allows them to go on for longer, but they can only do this by reducing the exercise intensity. So if you like, performance will suffer, but they can then go on for longer. The weather shows no sign of letting up. As the sun goes down, the size of the swell increases. Changeovers become quite frantic, and at any moment, the men could be crushed between the two boats. For the first time, they're being really tested. They didn't expect it to be easy. Although they are not too worried about the conditions, the fear of failure drives them on. I guess the only other fear that I have would be that you know, we might not break the record. I mean, uh, I think thus far, and you know, based on our understanding of previous record attempts, we have every reason to feel fairly confident, I think. But, as I say, you know, you know, the weather may not do what we want it to do, the crew may not perform as well as we want them to perform. Um, yeah, there are a whole host of variables which might, you never know, blow up in our faces. One of the problems is staying on course, 
and the rib drivers are frustrated because the rowers aren't going where they want them to. The mood's beginning to darken. Not really, you need to be with us. No, you need to be with us. Well, whatever. All right. Uh, no, no, seriously, if you speak to Buzz, um, Buzz cannot move any any further towards that sandbank. Yeah. There it's is so just much. right on the corner though, it's killing us. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah you're, what you're trying to do is, no, Wrong. are you trying to steer that course because of the wind? That's right, what right, I've told that's them. That's full steerage. Right, that's so what I told them. I wear green oaring as well. To get away from it. Rower Andy Chappell, who was trying to get his point heard, is one of the most experienced rowers after breaking the British record for rowing the Atlantic. Well, I suppose I've got that advantage that I've, I've done more than the other boys, you know, they've only done two, two and a half days and not gone into the third and the fourth day, so it's the unknown for them, but for me, I know what happens then, and it's all a mental thing. With tension and strong winds building, the crew are in for a tough night. They've taken more punishment than they expected to at this stage. They'll have to hope they have enough mental strength to face the challenges head on. After 17 hours, they've managed to travel around 100 miles, but there's still 390 miles to go. The night was rough, but the weather conditions for the rest of the day look even worse. Chinks in the armor are now beginning to show. Carl is just one of the rowers who has picked up a wrist injury. In these conditions, it will affect their performance, so they'll need to be strong mentally to overcome it. They are going to be in physical discomfort. You know, with all the training they've done, they're still going to push themselves for a long time, but their bodies are going to be complaining. And just to switch that off, and to keep going and know that this is going to stop and I am going to achieve my goal is huge. Now, in some ways, that's more important than how physically able I am. The shore crew, Tony and Jane, have made it to France. They are Hello. about to get the permits so the convoy can move Hello. through the locks quickly. If they don't get the paperwork sorted out properly, it could well, cost the rowers valuable time. How are we getting on? Um, have, you, have you got a computer with you? We're, we're uh, doing a, a log um, on the website, so uh, you can keep, keep up on that as well as speak to us, you know. So you're going to make, make sure those locks are ready for us. We're going to go and make sure everything's ready. We're off to see the man in Rouen now. While the shore crew head off to the first lock, the crew on Tristan take time to prepare for their next session. Some have a hearty meal, others massage life back into aching muscles whilst a few quietly search for some clean pants. There's been no let up in the conditions. It's far tougher than predicted. With around 300 miles left to go, mentally the rowers start to question themselves and aren't sure if their bodies will cope. It's hard work, you're all over the place, you have to work, yeah, you know, stay really on your seat, you know? One minute you're always up there, next bit's down there, then you're here, then you're there. It'd be okay if we could all be here and there together, but we're not. <laughs> the weather is threatening to knock the fight out of them. On board Lekka Lekka, the crew are feeling demoralised. They don't know how much more punishment they can take. Every pull of the oar is sapping their energy. It's getting a hard push against wind and tide and sloppy and... We want to go home. It's tough. <laughs> but it wouldn't be fun if it was easy. Every single one of us is going to have a moment of serious questions going through their head. And you hope at that point that something is just going to go i.e. some person is going to help you out of that little bit of a trough that you, you might be in and take you into the next session. Because that's how it is, you know, you, you're feeling bad and something lifts you and on you go again. You make that next corner, you go around it, it's a bit brighter. And you work till the next trough and then someone will help you out again. It would get easier if they changed course and crossed the shipping lane in French water. The French authorities have forbidden them but they're desperate and want Rob to challenge the decision. But he's asleep. 
Okay, can you report immediately to us because our boys really are not happy to do another run on this on this tack. Over. Oh, understood. Out. I mean, basically, we're just punching swell at the moment, and we're also punching the wind. Now, uh, as you can imagine, when you're trying to row into that, you can't go very quickly. So it's just sapping energy at the moment. Now, we know that at some point in the near future, we can make a left turn across to France, into French waters. But obviously, we've been given some fairly spurious instructions suggesting that we have to go a lot further in the kind of westerly direction before going south to France. And uh, so it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a, a tad demoralizing. The mood is becoming tense. Rob Platz is woken up so the decision can be made. But they don't get the answer they were looking for. At the moment, we are within 0.1 of a mile of our planned route and position. Um, we're on an improving forecast as well. So I'd like to give it another little while before we uh, turn. Um, so I, I'm, if I had a very good reason, like there was a safety issue, then I might be able to turn south or whatever. Boys, is there a safety issue you can think of? I've got a paper cut. Rob's decision is another body blow, and not what they wanted to hear. The question now is can their tired minds and bodies deal with it? As the rowers try and come to terms with the decision, Rob comes back to them over the radio. Um, access that to Tristan over. Okay. I've um, just heard from the Dover Coast Guard as I, I called them to ask about uh, the possibility of crossing the shipping lanes. Um, they hadn't got a problem with it, uh, but I explained about the, uh, the, the French requirements to stay out of them. So um, just hold on one moment. So um, I asked them whether they might speak to the French on our behalf, which they have done and uh, explained that because of the westerlies that we were suffering from, um, the French um, surprisingly have, uh, but nicely, agreed uh, that we can cross the lanes now. So uh, we'll be uh, plotting a new course shortly. Uh, Tristan Lever. Oh, yeah, well, I, I, I guess we're, we're, we're happier now. I mean, basically, we've, we've got what we wanted. Um, you know, and and we've, we've done it through the official channels, so I mean, we, we are within the rules. Nothing is going to come back and bite us on the bum, so, uh, so we're much happier. Despite the change in direction, they were still having to work incredibly hard. But the decision was a real boost to morale, and high spirits were back. And while all this was going on, Tony has made progress on dry land. We've now got their permits to go up to Paris on the river for all five boats. That's those not very pretty. Um, now we've got to find somewhere to park the trailer for the next two days. Go and visit them at the first lock to tell them we're coming tomorrow sometime between midnight and 2 a.m. Then get ourselves ready to meet everyone tomorrow morning at 10. And that'll do. <laughs> no? Lunch. <laughs> Lunch. <laughs> you got The relief after the change in course didn't last long. The swell is now bigger than ever. This is man versus the elements, and their nerves are being tested to the limit.
they duck under and over the waves, straining every sinew as they make slow progress. Secretly, the rowers are questioning if they can carry on. Many think they might have to abort the challenge. The Lekka Lekka crew get ready for their next shift. Matt Haradine is in a bad way. He is suffering from acute seasickness. But he's refusing to quit. I don't get any sleep on my next shift, I'm going to be psychotic. <laughs> I've got an hour. I've got an hour, that's all I've got. It'll be an hour in two days. As sickness takes hold, the crew's performance is suffering. If they're suffering with the seasickness, which they'll probably feel more when they're actually resting than when they're doing the exercise, um, that will have a draining effect. Of course, if they come back into the rowing boat feeling sick, they're going to be very unprepared for the, for the exercise ahead. Back on board Tristan, most of the team are feeling sick. Adek watches over his son Sam, who's now beginning to struggle. I don't know if he thinks it helps. <laughs> um, when he's not feeling very well, I try and feed him. I think he gets a bit fed up with that. But uh, I think it's good, you know, especially after this will be the third one. And um, yeah, I'm going to be looking now. He, he looks after, he looks after himself. You know. He looks after me now. Yeah. The rowers are feeling their vulnerability in the middle of the English Channel. The power and might of nature rages up against the men who are trying to overcome the force. This is the toughest and most dangerous point so far. Each changeover is an opportunity for disaster. Seasickness has also gripped them, something Matt has experience of. When we did that cross channel row, I was sick, but it was like getting back on the rowing boat. I don't want to be on this boat, I want to row. That's what I'm here for. So. You know, that's the, the fear, I suppose, of such, but, um, you know, everybody's in it together and you, you don't want to let anybody down, so... Again, we're just going to have to see. We've got three days, so... It's a lot of seasickness. His sickness was so serious, it needed a visit from the crew's doctor. Matt was given a powerful injection. If he doesn't recover, going a man down will put the exhausted team under even more pressure. As night falls, the rowers power on, but they're still harboring doubts. If the weather gets worse, the challenge could come to a sudden end. And right on cue, just when the last thing they needed was a problem, the rudder broke. In the darkness, and with even worse weather expected, they might struggle to stay on course. By morning, the crew had reached the mouth of the Seine and the halfway point. But the night had brought with it even more problems and realized one rower's fears. I'm more worried about things out of our control, like hitting a piece of driftwood in the channel or being stopped by the French authorities or actually having something out of our control which, which stops us completing the challenge. The rudder caused them problems in the night and at one point, they ploughed straight into a heavy object which burst open the nose, flooding the cavity with water. They inspected at first light and realised the severity of the problem. The cavity holds around 100 kilos of water, which seriously slows them down and will make rowing even harder as they become more tired. They will try and repair it in the river but if they can't, the record could start to slip away from them. 
Hopefully we can start to make some decent progress. And uh, we should be getting a fair bit of tidal assistance when we actually turn in onto the same proper, so it'll make, uh, make running a damn sight easier. I'm and sure we should uh, start to clock up a few miles fairly quickly, hopefully. So, uh, it's given everyone's spirits a bit of a boost and uh, we're looking forward to getting on the river again. The Tristan team go out and just minutes later, the guard boat grinds to a halt. Rib, could you come over to me, please? OK. My dad's alarm didn't bloody sound. Buzz, are you right, over? Yes, mate, we're um, moving out into deep water now. Okay, I'm, I'm literally aground at the moment. Uh, see if you can get to us. If not, uh, maybe the rest of you drop your line to us. Maybe. Very, very gently. Very, very gently, you tow me, though. The crew are well aware that the loss of a guard boat could seriously threaten the challenge. Now, we're on a rising tide, so that's fine. coming up, so you may want to stay there for half hour or so. No, we're off now, we're fine. OK, thanks. It turned out to be just a sandbank, but it was another close call for the challenge. They're in the mouth of the Seine. They've got a problem because they hit something uh, in the water last night. They've got to make a patch and with a rubber gasket of some sort, but who knows what it is or anything. They had a bit of rough weather during the night, so they got a bit wet and cold. We're now going to get in the car. We're going to go up and find them. But finding them was proving harder than it should be. To come along all of this lot up to La Vallée. Well, we can be able shoot to film out, them. come back. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of... Um, Shooting backwards and forwards. The biggest problem is being on the right side of the river at the right time. So the and correct the right side, side of the road. <laughs> While the shore crew were speeding through the lanes, the rowers had their own race against time as they started to seal up the hole in the boat. Carrying out the repair while keeping the boat partially in the water is almost impossible. Every minute it takes is time lost to the challenge. So much is against them. The current spins them around and huge tankers threaten to run them down. At one point, the boat is almost wrenched off the rib by the wake of a tanker, taking some of the crew with it. If the repair isn't watertight, the boat will just fill up with water. It's a worrying time for everyone, as the rowers get on their way, praying the DIY job will work. But for the moment, it's a relief. What a difference a day makes. <laughs> We're all happy now. What a difference a day makes. Eh? Stick to your day yeah. job, eh? Yeah. We repaired the boat. We're tramping along. We've got loads of time to loss. We're all in good spirits. Last night we were all a bit down, but we're bouncing back. It's going really well. Even Matt, who was sick last night, is back on his food. There's nothing I can do about it. I mean, nobody wants to get seasick. It just happens. Whenever you want to get stuck in a deep, deep, get the job done, it's really difficult. But we're all sorted now and I'm keeping food down, so it's great. The turmoil of the previous night now seems a long way away. I don't think people will appreciate what it was like in the channel. Um, I think if it hadn't been a world record attempt and the money being raised for MS, I think we'd have probably probably packed it in, but uh, we, we struggled on and it, you know, as it happens, you know, we're here now, so that's great. The improved conditions mean the rowers are now eating up the miles, and the patched up bow is so far holding up. Although life on the water is better, many of the team have picked up some form of injury which will affect their performance. I'd like to be able to go through it without picking up any injury so I don't let anyone down. That's my biggest physical concern, I think, is, is getting injured. Um, Blisters has been a problem in the past, not on the Amsterdam road, but on the Hampton Dome. I, I got blisters on my hands quite early on, and uh, took a bit of, of work to keep patching those up. So 
Hopefully if I can stay fairly you know, injury free and, and just have a good steady row right there. But his luck wasn't in. Um, yeah, as you can see there, the toes are getting a little sore. It's, it's mainly because of the last, um, well, most of this, during this day and the early morning session since I come back on duty. Um, because it's been calm, my shoes here have been getting dried out. So um, the rubber in the toes has started to, to just rub against my toes. The fast flowing river is helping them eat up the miles. And now they can see how fast they're going as they pass the mix of industrial developments and picture book villages. They also prove a welcome distraction from the monotony of rowing. Although the river is like a mill pond, the team are by this stage exhausted. They have faced tougher conditions than they expected and there is still 200 miles to go. Having come this far, the fear of failure is even more intense. I think the fear of not, of not beating the record. Um, I think all the rowers would probably say that, yeah, we're, we're there to, to, to do a vital job for, for MS, but once we get started, the, the aim is to beat the world record uh, and to get there uh, in one piece. And I think for me personally, failing in that is, is, is my biggest fear. As they glide down the river in the last of the evening light, there's some good news. They had to get to this point before dark because it's against the law to travel up the first part of the river at night. It means Rob Platts will be a happy man. Um, we hope actually Secretly, I hope to reach the first lock still in daylight. I think that's possible. If we did that, then I'll be smiling at that point. Um, because it means that, that we're really on to, to shatter the record if, if, that, if we were given that opportunity. just waiting for the boats to come up the river to go through their first lock which we hope to have set ready and waiting for them. Uh, we've had a message that they're on their way so hopefully everything will go well. They've travelled 56 miles up the river to get to the first lock just past Rouen and about 340 miles in total but there's still 150 miles to go. A firework display is a welcome distraction while they wait for the water to rise. They sit tight for around 15 minutes before heading back out into the dark night. But their expectation of a smooth ride was way off the mark. They rode straight into a big problem. The guard boats were blinded by a fog they couldn't see a thing, which meant they could steer into the riverbank at any moment. Nerves were being tested to the limit. What's this on the surface? They did on the hour. Uh, I don't know what's how this? much later it was, ever. What's this here in front yeah, of us? Yeah, stand by one, Boat crews were woken up and had to act as lookouts on the deck. The rowers follow close behind. With lots of turnoffs in the river, 
they could easily get lost. I'm not sure which is harder now, last night or tonight. <laughs> Buzz White and right-hand man Stewart are the two most experienced guard boat crew. They're both lifeboat men, and they're guiding the convoy through the river. There's, there will be coming up a bridge. I've no idea of the spans of this bridge, if it's one level or not. I think it's just one. They can't see the bridge and aren't sure if they can all get under it. By just a matter of a few inches, they get through. And with the rest of the boats safely under, they can breathe a sigh of relief and head towards the second lock. It emerges from the mist and is a welcome sight. Somehow they'd got through the fog, but at what cost? It's quarter past five in the morning. We've just done two locks, the second of which at La Garenne is probably the quickest lock I've ever seen happen. The boats were in and out in under six minutes. We allow 30 minutes per lock in the schedule, so a good amount of time was gained. Let's hope that the other four go as well. We'll know that later on today. That's it, we're off to bed for five minutes. The early morning mist welcomes in the new day, and the rowers are now in the final stretch. They've still got four locks to negotiate and 115 miles to go. They're on track, but this is no time for relaxing and taking their eye off the goal. We've got to dig deep on every department, every single department. You know, we've got to maintain the pace, put the pain aside, and we've got to improve on everything that we're doing so far so that we don't make any silly mistakes. We don't let, let ourselves slip um, at what is a crucial, crucial stage. It's very easy to have something like this and all the hard, hard, hard work that we've done over the past, you know, things that are really a little bit of a memory now, but the force fires that we were fighting in in the channel and, you know, the, all, all the things that happened, the boat bumping, the repairs, that would all be for nothing if you sort of went and did a stupid, stupid thing at this stage of the game. The challenges now aren't to do with the conditions, which are perfect. It's continuing to get into the boat and work hard for an hour at a time. The sun and calm water can make relaxing tempting, but they must overcome the urge. I expect to be feeling physically completely shattered, mentally drained as well, because obviously it's going to be quite mentally tough the whole way through as well, trying to get through. Normally the worst part is normally in the night, you find the dust or dawn and period is quite a hard time to go through really so that could be another thing so I think the mental side I think would be completely mentally drained as well as physically. They look set to beat the record now barring any disasters. The DIY repair to the boat has kept the water out so far and even the dodgy rudder is doing its job. On board Lekka Lekka the men have changed their focus from simply breaking the record to smashing it. I think trouble is now we know we've sort of more or less got it unless something bizarre happens. Uh, bizarre? Bizarre. Bizarre. So it's easy to get in a cruise mode, but we've got to try and keep pushing if we can. Even if it's just a little bit. No, 
know, we've got to push as hard as we can. We still want to make it hard for people to break. If you know, we'd like people to take up the challenge. We've got to make it that it is a hard challenge for them to beat. If you, you set a record, you want to try and keep hold of it so you make it as hard as possible. As they approach lock five, they have been rowing for just over 74 and a half hours. Rob has some news for the whole fleet. It's the first time he will have given out such accurate information. And they're in for a shock. Uh, London to Paris uh, fleet, London to Paris fleet, uh, listen up, listen up. Uh, our new ETA is nine o'clock British time, nine o'clock British time tonight. It's uh, amazing news. They were predicted to finish in Paris in the early hours of the following morning. Now they could knock more than 10 hours off the record. And they should finish before the sun sets on the city. We're not there yet, though. I keep saying this, we're not there. Anything can happen, so uh, not until we cross that line. A new race is now on. To finish in under 80 hours. They set a frightening pace as they fly past the riverside buildings and some of the more flamboyant local characters. The key is the fact that we are such a strong team. Individually, we might not be fantastic, but together, I think we can be, excuse the pun, but we can be awesome. Tristan team have finished their last leg and have given their all. They hand over to the final crew just minutes away from the finish line. They've done their job. Now it's down to the final five rowers to take the boat to the tower and into the record books. They've traveled 479 miles. There's one to go. The force five wins, the broken boat, seasickness, guard boats running aground, and navigation problems are all now forgotten as they power towards the line and into the world record books. They'll be the fastest team to ever make the trip in a rowing boat. broken the record, but destroyed it. Coming in at 79 hours, 9 minutes and 26 seconds, more than 11 hours quicker than the previous record. We expected that we were going to chip a fair amount of time off the record, but over, over 10, I think over 11 hours in the end, that's a tenth of the time, that's, that's a phenomenal achievement. So everyone's thrilled. There was a lot of soul search on the second day, to be honest, it's our second night, sorry, when it was really rough. I got, I got very cold and a, a few of the boys got really seasick as well. So yeah, we definitely had to dig deep then. And especially after taking a hold, we lost the rudder as well. We had lots and lots of problems that we just battled through. That's the good thing about the team. It's such a good team spirit. We just carried on and got the record. What I can say is organised brilliantly. Rob Platt. He did well, the lad. <laughs> <laughs> He's eating all our food. <laughs> Rob Platt did a brilliant job of, of organising it. I mean, how he got it, I don't know, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's highs and lows. Like, I expected it. I didn't expect it to be a walk in the park. And I'm glad it just panned out the way it did. I actually felt, gosh, we're safe. You know, we've done it because we've just worried all this time. You know, is, is something going to go wrong? Have we thought of everything? Are we actually going to be able to break the record? 
have we got the planning right? Have we thought of everything? And the answer to all that was actually yes we have. And yes we have. We have indeed broken it, smashed it, shredded it. The teamwork was awesome, you know, listening to the radio, you know, the um, the work in between the boats. I just had to, I was, I was just in awe, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it, you know, it was so amazing. And that's how far the team spread out in working as, the jigsaw has been complete, you know, it was a lot of pieces to start, there was thousands of them and we took ages to sort all the, all, all the, the pieces out, we got the square edges in and now we've just nailed the final one and it's turned out into a picture of the Eiffel Tower, so, which off. Almost four days ago, 16 amateur rowers left London heading for Paris. 480 miles later, they're world beaters after finishing in under 80 hours. Ordinary people who have achieved an extraordinary goal.